folks, welcome back to Dub After. This is Chris once again. So, folks, welcome back to Chris White After here on the 28th of June, 2021. It is a Monday, a manic Monday. Let's get to the headlines with in-depth news analysis coming shortly afterwards. First off, Ramaphosa closes down South Africa with his level four adjusted lockdown constraints. What does that mean? We'll give you more information on that here shortly. The National Coronavirus Command Council, just to make sure that you'd be up to date on what Ramaphosa failed to mention, has gazetted the restrictions for South Africa. Duma Kupeba has uh, said that lockdowns and austerity have done nothing for South Africa, and I'd have to concur with that. Schools to close once again in South Africa under the current restrictions. Former South African National Defense Force General calls for an investigation into the debacle in Bangui in the Central African Republic a couple of years ago, in which 15 South African soldiers lost their lives. The Tourism Ministry Advocacy Group in South Africa is asking or lobbying the United Kingdom to remove South Africa from its red list. Why? South Africans are in prison. Nobody can go there. What's the purpose of that? Cape Town, Johannesburg, Durban, and Nelson Mandela Bay or Port Elizabeth are among the most violent cities in the world, according to a survey. Three Springboks have tested positive, sending the British and Irish Lions tour into an utter tizzy as these folks from the Northern Hemisphere arrive in South Africa yesterday. Inflation is hitting the food sector in Namibia just like it is in South Africa, proving once again that one South Africa gets a cold, Namibia gets sick. Half of all Zimbabweans, according to the, Gu the Guardian, have been pushed into extreme poverty in the course of the pandemic, proving once again that the kleptocracy of ZANU-PF is not capable of proper governance. No other country has pushed half of its population into extreme poverty, only Zimbabwe. Senegal is moving its government data onto Huawei system on, under the presumption that it will give them secure data. <laughs> news for Senegalese. Don't give your government any data because the Chinese will have all of it. In case you don't believe that, just take your luck with that one. Ask the folks of the African Union what it's like. Jack Dorsey, the Twitter CEO, the BBC, and Nigeria. Nigeria's Asman Air is finally ready for liftoff. This new airline ready to take off, taking over a year to get approval, and it's ready to go. Election results in Ethiopia's election this week are imminent, waiting for those results to be announced, and as we expect, with 20% of the electorate unable to vote because of ongoing conflict and restrictions, plus the war in Tigray, we expect to see Abe win a comfortable re-election. China releases images from its Zurong Mars rover in an effort to keep up pace with the United States. The left gains in France's regional elections at the expense of the right and the extreme right, and a 542% increase in the arrest and detention of convicted sex offenders at the U.S. southern border under the Manchurian cadavers regime. Shocking, they're even arresting people. And then finally, if we have time, we'll talk about Woke Graphic. I'm sorry, National Geographic. Woke Geographic. There you go, folks. Those are the headlines for today, the 28th of June, 2021. Let's get into the in-depth analysis of these stories right now. First off, right out of the gate, Yesterday, the 27th of June, 2021, President Sir Ramaphosa spoke to South Africans and he delivered the bad news. The country is going to level four, effective today. So it was just three or four hours after his speech, less than four hours, when it took effect. Curfew, 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. All public spaces open, but mask wearing compulsory. Schools closing effective Wednesday. With the last school being closed on Friday as students are in the middle of sitting exams right now. How is that going to work? More effort to keep South Africa's citizens illiterate, stupid, and dependent on the state. The ANC is very good at this. It was hilarious to watch President Ramaphosa about a week ago talk about Bantu education when he was celebrating uh, celebrating Youth Day in South Africa. Talking about Bantu education, it was no education at all. Well, ANC education is worse than no education because it really is no education. You can't even go to school under the ANC. It's abysmal and abject failure. Ramaphosa announces, but the big one that got a lot of people's attention was, of course, the alcohol ban. Public ga gatherings are banned. Indoors, outdoors, it does not matter. They're all banned. With little room to move in the economy while the Hauteng healthcare system is overwhelmed, Ramaphosa is announcing the introduction of level four lockdown across South Africa, including banning public gatherings, the sale of alcohol, while ordering all schools to close by July 2nd. In a televised address on Sunday evening, Ramaphosa, who spoke in a somber tone, as if he could speak in an upboat, upbeat tone, 
So the country would move to adjusted level four to reduce person-to-person contact and flatten the rapidly increasing cases, which have reached new peaks in Tang. Do you remember March of 2020, folks? The squirrel, Cyril Ramaphosa, said we need 21 days to prepare hospitals, to get our schools ready, to flatten the curve. Does this sound familiar? Does it sound like Fauci and the CDC? Does it sound like that? Yeah. So now he wants 14 days. The country is locked down for 14 days. And Kozizani Dalimizuma's National Coronavirus Command Council has appeared back on the scene. Restrictions remain in place until 11 July. Places closed to the public include the following. All gatherings are prohibited except funerals, and they must be less than 50 people. The following must close the public. Gyms and fitness centers, casinos, taverns, shabines, and bars, restaurants, except for off-site consumption. So you can have takeaway and delivery, theaters and cinemas, museums, conference facilities, older persons, residential facilities. That's not what he said. He said residential facilities would be restricted. This says they're closed. The movement of people is also controlled by the fascist regime of the Afghan National Congress. All people are confined to their home from 9 until 4 a.m. Closing time of businesses is 8 o'clock. Leisure travel in and out of Haltang province prohibited. People currently out to the province and reside there may return home. All public gatherings, including religious and social gatherings, are banned. Funerals, no more than 50 people. All schools be closed from June 30th. Alcohol sales are banned. Public transport continue to operate with no questions, despite the fact that people are shoulder to shoulder in them. All passengers required to wear facial covering. And there are no changes to South Africa's border crossings. Those are the major impacts of this 24-page document put together by the National Coronavirus Command Council. Take away your freedom. For his part, in Business Day, in an op-ed, Duma Kbule said, South Africa relies on lockdown and austerity with nothing to show for it. He says, we're proof there's no relationship between their severity and their success. Agreed. The African National Congress has achieved nothing. A few minutes after the Holland Czech Republic game in Budapest, which had a near capacity crowd of 53,000, Ramaphosa announced new lockdown that will have a devastating effect on the economy. It was already expected to have GDP growth rate far below the world average of 5.6. Absolutely. The ANC has accomplished absolutely nothing except destroying South Africa. That's all they've done in the face of this ongoing situation in over a year. Well, what about students? What happens to students? Well, Angie, the Minister of Basic Education, has let us know. Schools must close. In an effort to keep South African children stupid, uninformed, incapable of literacy and critical thinking, education will be closed once again. Schools in South Africa will be shut from Wednesday and resume after the winter holidays on 19 July, not on the 26th of July when they were originally scheduled. School Support programs will continue for grades 11 and 12, so there's the uh, students writing exams. Teacher vaccination program, in which nearly half the teachers receive their shot, will continue. And the hard lockdown has also affected university in-person mid-year exam plans. If you recall, the president yesterday announced that as a sector, schools will close with Wednesday, from Wednesday, with the final debate on Friday. The announcement from our side is that the learners in public and independent and private schools should be released for the winter vacation on Wednesday, the 30th of June. So the 30th is the last teaching day. Bantu education. There's no education at all. I agree, Sierra Ramaphosa, and the Bantu education delivered by the African National Congress is a disgrace. A South African general involved from the joint operations in the debacle in the Central African Republic. When I say involved, he was in South Africa, not in the Central African Republic. The events unfolded in Bangui a couple of years ago is demanding or calling for an investigation into this. Former general calls for thorough investigation in the Battle of Bangui, in which 15 South African soldiers died. Retired Major General Ashton Melindeni Sebango who was director of joint operations at the Defense Force at the time the Battle Bangui is accused the government and parliament of failing to investigate the incident properly, I would concur, or to provide adequate compensation to the wives and children of the soldiers who were died or injured. I have no idea what the what the mechanism is for compensation. Do they have insurance like we do in our military? I do not know that the government is responsible for providing compensation for soldiers that have died in service. In an open letter to Parliament's Joint Standing Committee on Defense, Sabango called for a full multiple disciplinary investigation to several different government departments and parliamentary oversight committees headed by a state advocate or judge to re-examine the incident. Fifteen soldiers were killed in this attack in March of 2013, despite the fact that the ANC had and the government had been flooded with intelligence, warning of an imminent threat. They weren't reinforced. A small contingent of sand F- troops was sent to the car in 2007 by President Thabo Mbeki's government to provide security for President Francois Bozaziz and military training. But in the face of a growing rebellion by the mostly Islamic Salika rebels, 
Jacob Zuma's government made the fatal decision to reinforce rather than withdraw the forces in January 2013. The Mongol also berates Sandef command and government for failing to adequately compensate the dependents of the 15 soldiers who died. He said he was told the widows of the fallen soldiers had received a ridiculous and laughable 200,000 rand each. He's angry, and with good reason. But what role did you play in it, and why did the military stay silent when they were forced to take on a mission they were ill-equipped for? The tourism body advocating for South, for South Africa is trying to lobby the United Kingdom and have South Africa removed from its red list. SATSA, a body that promotes inbound tourism to in South Africa, is lobbying UK parliamentarians and the British media to have South Africa removed from the red list with exorbitant hotel quarantine costs closing what used to be among the country's most important markets. South Africa has been shut out of the UK since late 2020 when a new variant showed up. Cape Town, Joburg, Durban, and Port Elizabeth ranked among the most violent cities in the world in a Mexican Council for Public Safety and Criminal Justice report. Interesting source, nonetheless, ranked in the top places. And here you go. Number 10 on this list, Mexico, of course, has the most dangerous, the top six. Then St. Louis, surprising, is listed number seventh. I would put Chicago there, not St. Louis, but based on homicides, uh, this is the rate for homicides per habitant. And Cape Town comes in 10th. Monday La Bay, Nelson Monday La Bay. 22nd, Durban, 31st, and Joburg, 40th in the top 50. Well, South Africa, congratulations, you finished in the top four cities in the top 50 most violent cities on the planet. Three players have tested positive for the Springbok squad, halting training and putting the British and Irish Lions tour in jeopardy, perhaps. Three Springboks test positive. Talks are underway for... Most of the eight-match British and Irish Lions tour to be relocated to the Western Cape amid a COVID-19 surge in Hao Teng. So now we're going to play these games in the Western Cape. This is yet another change to the British and Irish Lions tour, the gangster's paradise of South Africa. Lions are scheduled to leave Edinburgh at 8 p.m. South African time Sunday night, precisely the time South African President Ramaphosa addressed the nation. The plane took off 80 minutes later after a delay because they might have been waiting to hear details of the speech. The British and Irish Lions tour start their British and Irish Lions start their 12 yearly tour to South Africa with a game against the Lions from Joburg. The tourists will be landing in a province. I love how they call them tourists. <laughs> Gripped by the worst of the entire pandemic and news the Springboks have COVID outbreak in their squad. Five of the eight matches including two of the three tests, were to be played at Ellis Park, Loftus, and FMB Stadium. But with cases spiraling out of control, they are likely going to relocate these to the Western Cape. So Sibu Nkosi is tested positive, as has Vincent Koch and Herschel Yankees. These will be big losses for the Springboks. Three Springbok players test positive, throwing the training camp into disarray. In neighboring Namibia, which whenever South Africa sneezes, Namibia gets a cold, food prices, just like in South Africa, are spiraling out of control, with inflation up and pushing the cost of basic food staples higher. Price of food in Namibia is on the rise, increasing by more than any other item in the average consumer shopping basket. According to Namibia's statistics agency, inflation on food and non-alcoholic beverages during the first quarter was higher than on all other items. Not a shock, given that much food is imported from neighboring South Africa, which has also seen inflation in food prices. Hey, but don't take my word for it, folks. Look around you. Look at the price of what you paid. I purchased shampoo with conditioner from Pantene yesterday here in the U.S., and I previously purchased at the same Walmart, because it was the cheapest place to get it, a 38-ounce container. Well, I purchased the new container a few months later here, and it's 34 ounces with a label on it saying 20% more. Yeah, the 20% more wasn't more shampoo. It was less shampoo. And the price went from $5.99 to $6.71. Taking into account that it was 20% less, that almost dollar increase is significantly larger than that dollar increase. That's more like a 35 to 40% increase. Half of Zimbabweans have been pushed into extreme poverty, according to The Guardian, during the pandemic. Poor families cannot afford health care or schooling, but Good Harvest offers some hope, the World Bank claims. I disagree with that. The Good Harvest is because more land was put under till, but without proper farming techniques and water, it's not a good story. Number of Zimbabweans' extreme poverty has reached 7.9 million as the pandemic delivered another economic shock to the country. No, the kleptocracy of Zanu PF is what delivered the shock. Their idiotic, racist, BS policies are with the problem. According to the World Bank's Economic Social Update report, almost half of Zimbabwe's population fell into extreme poverty between 2011 and last year. Oh, well, that's a misleading article. That's a misleading article. That's not true. That That's half fell into extreme poverty. No, that's since 2011. That's very misleading. Well, thank you for the clickbait there. 
Guardian leftist newspaper getting the story inaccurate. Um, that's only part of the story. Well, speaking of <laughs> getting the story right, Senegal has decided to not rely on outside suppliers and entirely control its national data inside its own resources. But to do this, they purchased equipment from Huawei. So I guarantee you that none of your data will be secure. It will all be available to the Chinese officials and to Huawei's corporation. So good luck there. Senegal to move all government data to Huawei run data center. Mm -hmm. Interesting indeed. Senegal will move all government data and digital platforms from foreign servers, in other words, they've been based in Europe until now, to a new national data center in an effort to strengthen its digital sovereignty. So what they're doing is they're putting physical equipment in Senegal and not relying on data centers in Europe to provide a resting place for their data and to control it. I understand the desire, but you might have considered Ericsson or, I don't know, HTC or Motorola or, I don't know, somebody else, Microsoft, Google, somebody, not Huawei. I'm instructing the government from henceforth to migrate all state data and platforms to the data center. We have to rapidly repatriate all national data hosted out of the country, says Senegal's President Macky Sall at the launch on the 22nd of June last week. The 70 million euro data center was financed with a Chinese loan mm -hmm, and built with Huawei providing equipment and technical support. Mm -hmm. The first phase of the new facility will be open in around six months time and will, off, will offer hosting services to enterprises and other public bodies. S okay. The data center will tap into global networks through an undersea cable as well as the country's own 6,000 kilometer fiber op optic network. Eric Olander from the China Africa Project who previously has interviewed me uh, said that a portal that researches the reach of Beijing's ventures into the continent, the opening of the center marks an important milestone in Africa. This is the first time that a country is fully replicating the Chinese data governance model that requires all servers be located within a country's borders, providing the state with full access to the information. And there you go. There you go. But it's not just the state of Senegal that will have access to the information. It's Beijing. <laughs> wow. Not a smart move, Senegal. Not a smart move. Jack Dorsey, the Twitter CEO, is apparently loved by many in Nigeria. This from the propaganda outlet known as the British Broadcasting Corporation. Jack Dorsey unpicking Twitter's boss's passion for Nigeria. Well, we have this spat between Nigeria because they censored President Buhari. His Twitter platform is used to galvanize support for last year's NSARS protest, which began as a movement against police brutality and morphed into a confrontation with the political class and Nigeria's youth. But Twitter's blocked in Nigeria now after a recent spat between the two. Now, this, see how they propagandize here after a recent tweet by President Buhari was deleted? No, 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 no. See, see, this is the problem with the BBC. It's not factual or accurate. A tweet was deleted, but that's not why they were blocked. They were blocked because they banned Buhari. They suspended his account. Remember that? Not into perpetuity, but they suspended the cheek, the audacity to suspend the president of the country by a foreign company. Yeah, that's why they were suspended, not because of a deleted tweet. Facts, BBC, facts. I know they get in the way of your propaganda narrative, but let's go back to your propaganda. Many Nigerian, Nigerians adore Mr. Dorsey. Really? I don't know any, but perhaps there are some. His ideals of an open internet, <laughs> what? Freedom of expression, excuse me? And economic rights resonate with those who feel marginalized by their government. Far from being intimidated by the Twitter man, Mr. Dorsey has kept tweeting about Nigeria and has captivated many here. Well, let's see. Let me just run through that again. His open internet, this guy doesn't believe in open internet. He censors anyone that's center or right. They shut down accounts and delete people while leaving vile, racist, bigots, and hate-filled mongers on the Twitter sphere who are on the left. They don't do anything to those vile, disgusting people. I've reported people on Twitter endlessly. Not a single action taken against racist, bigots, and trolls. Nothing ever happens to them. So open internet, freedom of expression, I guess, if you want to tolerate that. Hate, but when you delete people who aren't hateful, that's not exactly open in internet. Anyway, so there you have it. There you have it. Jack Dorsey, Nigeria, please. Futsec Jack Dorsey. Nigeria's Asmin Air is set to finally get in the air with an Airbus A34600. Nigeria's Asmin Air has been given the tick of approval to fly its sole Airbus A34600 on international flights. After a series of recent demonstration flights, Nigeria's safety regulator cleared the plane to fly. Following a turbulent year, the approval is welcome win for Asmin Air. 
In early 2020, Simple Flying reported that Asmin Air picked up a former Virgin Atlantic A34600. The plane had flown from Virgin since 2006. The Airbus came to Asmin Air, but later in 2020, it was re-registered. The big Airbus was a strategic shift for Asmin. The remainder of the airline's fleet comprises Boeing 737-300s and 737-500. So getting this A34600 up in the air is a big deal for the airline. A big deal. It will allow them to consider flights to Dubai, to Jeddah, and to China. That could be very profitable for Asmin Air. Congratulations to them. We await the results of Ethiopia's elections. These results are imminent, despite the conflict ongoing in the Tigray, Tigray region of northern Ethiopia. With an expected result favoring President, Prime Minister Abe in a parliamentary vote boycotted by leading opposition parties and 20% of the population couldn't vote anyway, um, there are complaints about how open and fair the elections were in Africa's second most populous country, with a population just over 100 million, trailing Nigeria, which has about 208 million, 209 million residents. China has released images from its Mars rover, and they're just as cool as NASA's Mars rover photos. China releases videos of its Zhurong Mars rover. No sound. Come on, China, where's the sound? Where's the sound? Look at the Chinese space agency. It has that little Delta thing, just like Space Force. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> oh, landing right about now. Boom. And it's down. There you go. That's the Mars rover from China. And here you can see a little Mars rover on the surface there. Latest moves relay back to Earth via the Tiawen-1 satellite, which orbits Mars. The orbiter and the Mars rover are in good working condition, reporting safely from Mars to the party and to the motherland, and sending distant blessings on the century of the party's founding. <laughs> the first week of July, of course, will mark the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. France's regional elections have not gone well for the right or the extreme right. Done well for people in the center and also on the left who've gained ground. Regional uh, 2021. Peu de grands bacules, mais des changements de rapport de force. Well, a little bit of change there as we slide down here. These are the results comparing 2015 to 2021 in these regional elections. The left, the gauche, have gone from 585 to 673 seats. The center, which didn't exist, gained 124. The right dropped from 910 to 782, a significant drop. And the extreme right went from 358 to 250. And regional parties gained 85 from 57 so a bit of gain there for one side versus the other and here you go so left the center the right the extreme right and regionals in the different parts of france here in the united states at the southern border under the manchurian cadaver's regime bo chi jai the deputy premier of the chinese communist party who resides at 1600 pennsylvania avenue despite the fact that they've opened the borders up and just allow anyone to come across we are still seeing the arrest of convicted sex offenders in fact the number of convicted sex offenders thus far this year has increased by over 500 percent shocking indeed according to epic times 542 percent increase in convicted sex offenders arrested at the border border patrol agents have arrested 353 illegal aliens with sex related criminal convictions this year this fiscal year a large number of the detainees had prior convictions for crimes involving a minor. In the same period in fiscal 2020, agents had apprehended only 55 offenders and 58 in total for all of 2019 when Donald John Trump was the chief executive of this country and managed our borders. But we've seen a 542% increase. The number of criminals illegally crossing the southwest border has spiked in tandem with the border crossing surge this year. Convicted criminals are the most likely population of illegal aliens trying to avoid capture by the Border Patrol. They've detected more than 250,000 criminal alien illegal invaders who have evaded capture so far this year, according to the newly appointed Border Control Chief Raul Ortiz. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't need a paper report from my agents that talks about criminal alien sexual offenders and that they've been apprehended out there. Those folks aren't getting released in these communities. Guess what happens to them? They go to jail. When they get out of jail, they go back to the country of origin. Well, yeah, the ones you capture. On June 14th, a Peruvian child rapist was arrested by Border Patrol as he entered the United States illegally near Roma, Texas. Pedro Ascension Ore Giuseppe, 43, had been deported in 2020 after serving over five years for felony rape of a child in Idaho. On June 20th, Mexican national Isidro Efron Gerardo Rangel was apprehended as part of a group of 24 illegal aliens near Laredo. 
He's a registered sex offender with extensive criminal history and a conviction for indecency with a child in 2018 in Dallas. The list goes on and on and on, folks. This is what we have under Manchurian Cadaver, what's happened to our glorious country as we abrogate our responsibility to protect citizens. They're, they're eliminating the department responsible for addressing victims of criminal alien invaders' crimes. This administration is eliminating that. Why? You have a $6 trillion budget. You can't afford to have that department? Or is this simply a political message to show that you don't care about Americans? You only care about criminals that you allow into the country. Well, there you have it, folks. That's the news with in-depth analysis for today, the 28th of June, 2021, right here on the Night Owls edition. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate your support for Chris White Africa. God bless and have a lovely evening and a wonderful week ahead.